Welcome first-time listeners and returners to the Sports Deli, where everyone deserves a seat at the table. What about f***ing Colin? Why does he not have a f***ing job? Because he's still being white balls. Why is Tom not speaking out about that? He should be his biggest f***ing ally. And he hasn't said one f***ing thing. A lot of people that have come on this show, I don't know why, they've gotten some good f***ing jobs afterwards. Jim Rome in the jungle. It's right here in the sports deli, baby. We got some good ass karma right here. Let's fucking go. I love <laughs> oh, man. it. I love it. We hope you enjoy today's show, everyone. All right, here we go. Let's rock and roll, everybody. We're so honored to welcome as our last guest of season three of the Sports Deli Podcast, the first ever Associate Athletic Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of Colorado, the pride of St. Louis, Missouri, and Hazelwood East High School, Dewan B. Baker. Baker joined the Colorado staff from the University of Nebraska, where he had served in a similar role as the Huskers Diversity and Inclusion Director. In August of 2019, Baker co-founded the Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity Council of Excellence. I think you pronounce it DICE. Is that correct? That's correct. A membership organization that provides support and resources for diversity officers who work in athletics. He's also an advisory board member for Return on Inclusion, ROI, R-O-I, and an advisory committee member for the Winning Edge Leadership Committee. Dewan earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Missouri, where he also participated in track and field in the long jump. And we've had a number of Olympians on our show in the sport of track and field. His passion for diversity, equity, and inclusion started while he was attending Missouri, and it was the tragic death of Michael Brown nearby his hometown of St. Louis, an event that drew national attention that prompted his initial interest. He earned his master's degree in business administration, and a master in sport business management from the University of Central Florida in 2016, where he had ties to Dr. Richard Labchick, and he was a research assistant for Tides. And uh, I can't wait to talk to him about that because Richard Labchick is one of the most influential persons in the history of sports. And we also had Dr. Labchick on our show. If you haven't heard that podcast before, it it was phenomenal. After he earned his graduate degrees, he worked for the NCAA as a postgraduate intern in the leadership development department, and he is also an accomplished writer as he spent three years as a contributing writer in frontofficesports.com. His hobbies include podcasts like ours. Just kidding. I don't know if he actually likes our podcast. We'll find out at the end of the show, along with playing pickup ball and flag football. I'm sure Deion Sanders is liking that action. He's passionate about advocating for social change and is currently looking for an adjunct teaching position. So if anyone knows of any opportunities in the space of DEI, please let me know or reach out to Dewan directly. You can find him on Twitter at Dewan B. Baker, where he has his wallpaper as a picture of the 1968 Olympics that you see here for those of you watching uh, of Tommy Smith and John Carlos, who are silently protesting along with Australian Peter Norman, who doesn't get enough credit. And as a side note, we've also had two members of that 1968 track and field team on our podcast, Mel Pender and Lou Scott. Gotcha. Uh, D-Money, man. A, like I said, truly an honor. You're taking time out during your holiday break with your family to uh, join us here on the Sports Daily Podcast. And uh, I mean it uh, right here. Truly an honor to have you here. Uh, anyone tied to Dr. Richard Lapchick is welcome here anytime uh, as a guest or as a co-host, man. Welcome to the Sports Deli. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. Uh, so what, what was it like growing up? Uh, I went through St. Louis one time uh, on a Greyhound. I drove cross country and uh, I met some like really interesting people that we picked up in St. Louis as I was going from Baltimore back to San Diego. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had a couple guests on from St. Louis and one of the things that someone shared with me, a NBA player, uh, cause I asked him about music and how music basically took him around the world because he wasn't able to travel, but you know, did that music do that for you? Was that something where you like, uh, it resonated with you and you just could find a way to travel the world through music? I guess from a cultural perspective, it, it, I would agree with that. You can definitely 
understand and feel different parts of the world and different cultural aspects just based on where the music is from and where their artist is from and how they kind of tied into it right and so I definitely think it, it plays a role it can definitely give you a, a a really really good view of kind of what the world looks like in different parts too just based on again where you're kind of listening from and where their artist is from and how they kind of incorporate that into the music that they make too. It's interesting so I'm always curious about people's upbringings because you know we've had Jay Billis on here and I just posted another video with him on the show talking about how um scarring his childhood was as far as his basketball experience in high school uh and the coach didn't intentionally do it but he just was in over his head kind of thing and i've had other guests on from uh, bill curry who played in the nfl uh and coached uh for a long time at the college level yep. you know as well as um doug williams and uh, jim herrick and, and those guys in particular talked about how when it wasn't popular in the 60s obviously in the civil rights movement they would go into each other's neighborhoods, into black and white neighborhoods. If uh, you know the blacks wanted to play ball, they'd go into the white neighborhoods, and the whites would go into the black neighborhoods. And even though you know segregation was a thing, they no one really said anything. They just wanted to play sports, and sports has always been sort of that vehicle, you know, as you know. And track and field is is very eclectic. Track and field is very different uh, yep. than probably most sports. <laughs> so, what was it like? You know, growing up in St. Louis, which, you know, like Baltimore, like Detroit, where I'm from, you know, it has its, uh, you know, troubling area, Chicago. Yep. Um, you know, what, what was it like there? And and what did you learn about yourself from there to to help you be a better version of yourself day in and day out? It's very interesting because, of course, as you get older, you start to kind of reflect back on things and how they used to be and, and uh, things that you did notice younger that you'll notice now. But um, I had a I had a really good upbringing, but I, I didn't really recognize how segregated even my own family was and where we grew up was um, until you start to get a little older and you start going to, you know, basketball tournaments or track meets or football games and you start seeing the subtle differences. Right. So even things like coming into high school of like, oh, you know, we didn't have turf or lights in our field. And when we got to go play a Friday night game, that was a big deal. Right. Of like repairing of the lights under this turf and you know it's 45 minutes out outside of where we live and it feels like you know this very different thing and it's like well you know this part of that is a reason just as far as how the city is set up how things are are are, are separated um and how things have have really come to be from a historical context but uh for my but upbringing did, but did that sorry. piss you, did that piss you off or were you just sort of going with the flow and you were just excited to be a part of you know team sports and, and it's, sport in general it was it was both it was both for sure um you're excited because you don't get the opportunity much but then you start to think well why don't we have lights and why don't we have turf fields right so you know it's, it's something that we you kind of take with a grain of salt but you just try to show out when you got the opportunity and that's what we tried to do um anytime that we were able to kind of travel to to play in some of those venues or play some of those teams that we knew again that we weren't going to see very often. So we just tried our best to, to try to seize the moment, but definitely again, kind of ticks you off a little bit. Cause it's like, man, we're good. We can, we can, we right. can have turf fights. Right. So, uh, but upbringing wise, man, I definitely had a, a, you know, good family system. Grew up in North County, St. Louis, a uh, little bit of North city, St. Louis too, just depending on kind of where you caught me. But uh, I really, What's, what's funny is like a lot of people kind of coming up, especially athletes coming up, uh, thought I was going to go to a private school. And uh, it's funny, I was telling my wife and, uh, and my intern about this the other day of like, just fast forwarding back to eighth grade and thinking three months before high school starts, I thought I was going to uh, Chaminade High School, which is uh, where Bradley Bill, Jason Tatum, mm -hmm that's where I thought I was going to school to go to go play sports and, and get education all those good things and spent the whole summer going to camps meeting the coaches I, I spent the day there to, to kind of learn the school and kind of go through schedules and all that um, and about a month and a half before classes start uh, we get the the uh, financial aid statement if you will and my mom's like nah like <laughs> I, I can't we can't afford that we gotta find somewhere else right and at the time uh, my mom was kind of transitioning between uh, living in different places. And so I'm like, well, address is a stable enough to go where I originally would have went. And so she's like, well, you know, I called my sister and um, she called her sister, my aunt, and was like, hey, can DeJuan move in so he can go to high school with his cousin at his Woodies? And she was like, yeah, of course. And so we, we moved me 
into uh, my aunt's house in a matter of like two weeks and rode and started about a week late because we had to kind of get everything to show. But um, I ended up in public school and I actually think that was probably one of the better things that's happened uh, to me just to kind of get to know people, learn people and understand kind of where I grew up to. Sport wise, it probably could have been a little different if I went to a private school and kind of had the, the access to the resource and all that good things. But I think mm. I think I turned out pretty well. So I'm not uh, not too bitter about it. And, and definitely, like I said, really shaped my perspective of kind of growing up in the county and the city of St. Louis, just kind of seeing a blend of the styles, too. Yeah, I went to a Jewish day school growing up through fourth grade. And then when I went to public school in fifth grade, man, that different. was the best. Well, it was different. And I had ne- I don't think I had ever met a person of color uh you know, obviously there's not many Jewish, you know, people of color. We could go down that rabbit hole lately. What's been going on with mm. Ky- Kyrie. But anyways, it was a one, I mean, literally life altering experience. And it can't, it happened at a good time. Cause um, you know uh, I've talked about this a lot, but I've had six dads, two of them have unalive them you know, on the social media all the time. I said unalive. two of them have committed suicide. And uh, so it came during one of those times when, you know, my father uh, took his own life. And so it was just like, a, like a light went on you know just about you know uh so much more is out there yeah uh, and so you know you were influenced um by the the murder of michael brown and so was that while you were uh, at missouri yes i was a senior yeah. in college when and so did you pivot right after that and you're like like fuck the dumb shit like i can't be doing this bullshit (laughs) because no because that's what happened with me with this podcast like i was just talking about stuff that's irrelevant an hour later i was like man (laughs) i i just can't do it anymore like i this show has to be more about being a bridge being an ally about uh, educating about mobilizing and so is that sort of what happened with you you're like okay that light just went on so it was a collection of things and really it was fortunate timing to an unfortunate event right and so um at the time i was done competing um so i ran track at mizzou as a walk-on my freshman year i actually left the team after my freshman year Hmm. and instead of carrying through to continue my eligibility i started working in athletics um i thought about transferring but i didn't really want to leave the school and really the backstory to that is prefer walk-on wasn't gonna kind of get on scholarship for the next year I'm moving off campus. I need to pay rent. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a new crop of, of recruits coming in. I I, I kind of just was like, you know what? I'm healthy. Um, I enjoy the sport. Track and field is also one of those sports that you don't necessarily have to be on a team to compete. So you can always compete on the task and all those things, right? And I actually did a little bit of that too when I left. But mm-hmm. I was like, you know what? Let me let me step away and, and kind of see what else I can I can kind of mold myself into. And so I started mm-hmm. working in athletics and working in sport right after. And so leading up to my senior year, I uh, I worked um, six, like parking lot and uh, parking lot, and I did a little bit of ushering for football. Uh, I ended up working as a marketing intern for the volleyball team in Mizzou. Um, then I started working in the ta- uh, in the ticket office as well, um, and I was helping a a, a school uh, called Stevens College. It's an NAIA All Women's College, about five minutes down the street from Mizzou, helping their sport information director kind of do. Uh, you know, spot spotting games as far as stats, mm-hmm. um, you yeah. know, wrote a handful of stories and, and things like that. So I was I was getting a lot of experience, but I really, really enjoyed that. My senior year gets here and this is the summer, well, spring. Um, I get accepted into this this program called the McNair Scholars Program, which is um, a federally funded um, grant program that hopes to increase the um, socioeconomic and racial and ethnic diversity within uh, higher education specifically with like professors and teachers and lecturers et cetera, right and so you put in an application uh, basically show that you have an interest in research and they pair you with a faculty advisor to teach you how to research essentially right um, and they pay you to research and they give you prep to uh, take the GRE or go to grad school or uh, write write letters to kind of get into PhD programs all the things and so Fast forward all that, okay, I really have an interest in sport. I know I want to do some of the athletics, don't know exactly what. Uh, at the time, I got accepted to McNair, and I didn't know what I wanted to study. I knew I wanted to study something in sport, of course. Um, and I was kind of tracking down this, this area of, like, diversity in sport, but I didn't know exactly how that fit. And Michael Brown, unfortunately, you know, gets killed. And this is about a week or so before classes start. And I'm seeing 
all this stuff unfold in real time where I have friends who are from St. Louis, similar to myself, you know, who are starting to get really, really active in and kind of advocating and protesting, really trying to galvanize a lot of the student body. So I'm seeing that piece. Um, I'm seeing former uh, teammates and friends, et cetera, who are, who are athletes at Missouri and other schools start to talk about it. And uh, it was pretty apparent that they didn't feel like they either had support or just didn't feel like people were really understanding or noticing what they were going through. And on top of that, I was uh, really seeing, like, try, I obviously dealing with my own thoughts and feelings and perspectives and things that were happening, too. Mm. And I'm like, man, it's a, I don't know what really is going on, but I kind of need to pay attention to all this stuff that's going on, right? And slowly throughout that first semester of my senior year of college, so August to December, et cetera, I would start seeing things and start seeing signs that really said, you know what, you need to pay attention and, like, really, really try to put this stuff together for yourself, right? So I would go... Um, to protest and I would see I would have friends mm. who were organized who were speaking on a you know microphone speakers who were asking administration for resources all these things I would see athletes come and they would hide in the back they would put their hood on try to be inconspicuous all the things and I'm like mm. something something's there I don't know what but something's there right um, in addition to then found out about UCF and ties the Institute for Diversity Ethics and Sport the racial gender report card, all these things I'm finding out in real time. And I'm like, I want to study that. And so I'm like, I want to study these things. I have this experience as an athlete. I have friends and I have my own general thoughts, opinions, perspectives around activism, allyship, uh, social justice, et cetera. And like I said, all this is literally falling into place. Like as I'm traveling through my first mm. semester of my senior year, mm. I'm like, man, there's a lot here that I just really want to be involved in and learn. Uh, and then the last thing was, I love my alma mater with all my heart. They botched it. They were not ready for it. And you could see the real life co consequences and the real time things of, of students leaving and transferring, of, um, you know, friends essentially breaking apart because they didn't know how to talk about this and had different opinions. Uh, professors getting in hot water because they didn't know how to talk about it in class. You, you would see a lot of the tension that was boiling over in, in sport and athletics, right? And so all of the things that were happening specifically with the strike and Mizzou with the football players and fall of 2015, yep. mm -hmm. all that boils over from a year prior where there were guys from football, track, basketball, et cetera, who were going to these protests mm -hmm. and wanting to be involved and not feeling like they had an avenue to do so. Right. And so all these things are happening in real time. It's just like, again, I'm like, I got to pay attention to this. Like something, something is, I don't know what's being told to me or how it's being unfolded, but it's definitely something that yeah. things are going off, right? And so, you know, since then, it's, it's really just been one light bulb after no, another one revelation after mm -hmm. another, whatever term you want to use. And, and we could talk more about kind of what those have been, but that was really kind of the, the flickering of the light bulb for me that says, hey, you want to pay attention to this stuff, right? Um, and originally at that time, uh, I wanted to do stuff in athletics. I thought I was going to go do a little bit of work in athletics. I thought I was going to end up going to get a PhD eventually. I still want to, but I thought mm -hmm. this is research. Like you're going to have to research this stuff. That's how you stay involved. That's how you get invested. That's how you make a difference because my job did not exist when I was coming out of school. It just didn't. Um, or it did, but I didn't know about it. There but, weren't as many receipts. Oh, no, no, absolutely not. Absolutely yeah. not. So. Wow. That's fascinating, uh, man. Uh, I, I always have a lot of things going through my head when people respond, uh, and so uh, this was no different. And let me ask you, you, you mentioned Tides, and for those of you that don't know who Dr. Richard Lapchick is, Dr. Richard Lapchick, uh, if you don't want to watch the podcast and you just want to know about him in, in, in a nutshell, uh, where Dewan studied, uh, Dr. Lapchick has been an ally and a bridge and a civil rights activist for a long time. Uh, he went to a basketball camp, met Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Somebody called him the N-word. He stepped in. He got dropped. Uh, but but he and Kareem established a relationship, and they've been friends ever since. Mm -hmm. And as a side note, Dr. Lapchick's father uh, coached in the NBA and signed the first ever African-American in the history of the NBA. And so, you know, Dewan is tied to him. And there's a, you know, there's a movie out, you know, there's, a, there's the reports that, that come out every year, uh, the report cards uh, yeah. that Dewan talked about. Um, and it's incredibly important in this multi-layered issue to change the narratives uh, from the Rooney Rule to the Bill Russell Rule, you know, to all kinds of different uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, education, uh, because uh, schools are still not prepared 
like you just talked about. And so yep. to, to that point, uh, I remember a story that um, in the mid 90s, uh, Dr. Jonathan Alexander Lowney, who's currently working at North Carolina A&T, okay. and he's a psychology, um, you know, PhD in psychology. And, you know, diversity training really wasn't a thing back then. Like it was, but, you know, we were just probably ahead of the curve at a, at a PWI. And so he told a story where he got in an airplane. He's African-American. And out of the cockpit comes a Hispanic uh, gentleman. And in his head, he said to himself, oh, hell no. I know that motherfucker ain't flying this plane. Mm. Now, he didn't say that out loud. But as a person of color, that's what he thought. And so we all, for whatever reason, you know, have these thoughts and – you know, it's really about having thoughtful dialogue and discourse so that we can get to a higher level intellectually, nuance wise, because a lot of this stuff is nuances. And I see it as an influencer online constantly. As a Jewish person, I just posted something and this guy said, you should go talk to a Jewish person and ask, you know, about Kyrie. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to cuss him out and be like, motherfucker, I am Jewish. What the fuck are you talking about? How many black people have you spoken to in the last three years since George Floyd? And, you know, so there's a little bit of pushback, but, uh, um, you know, sometimes I get triggered because, uh, you know, I want to be thoughtful in, in terms of educating and mobilizing because it's, you know, I can't imagine being a person of color because of not only generational trauma uh, and the, 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 the trigger level must have um, just a heightened level of sensitivity to it. And I just can't even imagine it because I get hot real quick about certain things about people that are just flat out ignorant or in denial about stuff and one guy yesterday was like yeah well we'll take care of you know the 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 people of color in jail with the aryan nation you know like that's the stuff that that comes out now since 2016 right not to go not to go too far sideways but you know these are things that we all have to push back against and and educate people about so we can all be uh, better allies right and so to that story about the the pilot you know what what talk about you know what you learned from dr lapchick so and and how you incorporate those teachings now to thoughtfully bridge the gap between black and white america that's a loaded <laughs> question i i think the first thing i learned it might be a little cliche the first and main thing i really learned from dr lapchick was audacity he he was the first person that i knew at that age with that influence with that power who was not scared to say anything, right? And he's white, just so everybody yeah. knows. Yes. Uh, very, very white. Yes. A, yeah. uh, at, at the time, he's a little older now, but when I, I was mm -hmm. working and, and studying under him, 67, 66, whatever age, but 67 year old white guy who has ties to the NBA, father was an NBA coach, uh, played collegially. I think at the time that was like maybe JV or something like that, but played collegially at St. John's. And he was that guy that would walk in a room with a Roger Goodell, Adam Silver, Don Garber, whoever it was, and be like, y'all are not doing this well. What are you going to do about it? And, and we'll nice. sit there with a great face, right? Um, so the first thing I really learned about him was really the audacity to even start the conversation or to even call something out. And there are times where we would be in class where um, he didn't necessarily give or clarify his opinion because we all kind of knew where he stood, but he really cultivated or at least tried his best to cultivate a space. And that's something that I still try to take with me today and I still use to this day as well is what does it look like to really be this brave person and say, you know what, this thing is in everybody's mind. Let's, let's talk about it. Let's get to a solution in, in regards to what it looks like and why. And so that's, that's probably the first thing. I would say the second thing too is uh, I really learned the power of storytelling from Dr. Lapchick. Others too, but that he was one Man. that really, really understood, understands how to use it and, and can get people to really galvanize around the topic because of the way that he uses it and the way that he tells his own stories and the way that he tells other people's stories. And so he would tell us a, a example or a story. Um, he would tell us a story um specifically about how he the reason that he got into social justice in the first place he would say things and and tell the recite the story of, of his his father kind of telling uh or his, his father signing the first black uh player in the nba and he was like yeah I, I'm, I'm a six-year-old kid 
and I look outside my window and there's a there's a paper mache person hanging off our tree. Right. And like what like as a six year old, what does that do to you? And and how does that really sit and stay with you to eventually get into this type of work? And so those you. two things yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and those are the things that that really, really have always stuck for me with Dr. Left Chicken that he's used to really, like I said, really get give me to to kind of participate in his work and, and, and try to add to it. And the um, phone so, calls that people would would call yeah, and yep. be, be going threat. in on his dad and yes. he would be listening. Yes, all these things, right? Um, and I, I would say, like I said, for really with my time with Dr. Lapchik, that that I, the uh, audacity to start the conversation and, and and the power of storytelling have been two things that have really resonated with me and that and I've tried to carry through. And, and, and in regards to bridging this gap between Black and white Americans specifically, uh, I think a lot of it is still awareness. Um, I wish we weren't at that point, but I, I, I really think that's kind of where we are. I still think if you ask the average Black and or white American today, they still don't really cross over cultural lines that have a deep connection to other races. What I always think about is whether it's in my work, whether it's in a workshop, whether it's just getting to know people, right, is, you know, I, I often have the opportunity to give them a real life example and manifestation of what cultural difference and cultural connection can look like. And so I try to operate in that lens. Does it? Is it is the burden on me to do that? No, but that's something I take on because I, I think it's important. And I also think it's, for me, it's a lot easier to have a conversation with someone who might have a different thought, perspective, opinion, if I feel like we have that type of connection. And so I try to do that work early to say, hey, I'm going to get to know Michael and really understand where he comes from, really try to show more of who Dewan is so that if something were to happen or a perspective or a thought to share, I can say, Michael, no, we, we got to talk about that, bro. Like, that's that's not that's that's not that's not it right and here's why or here's what this perspective is uh can that get tiring absolutely like extremely right but that's that's at least my individual approach to it does it work for everybody no but uh then again also i know what works at least best for me and so that's the the lens and the operation in regards to how i try to take it yeah man it, it must have been mind-blowing the difference between it, getting your ed yourself educated about Dr. Labchick, you know, through writings or phone calls, et cetera, and then actually being in his space mm -hmm. and like, like you said, hearing these stories and like maybe never ever seeing a white person with this type of uh, impact, you know, in this space, because typically it's people of color and it's really a white issue. So it really should be more white people educating themselves because it's not black people's responsibility to right. teach white people about the two different narratives in this country so that that must have been an incredible experience uh yeah yeah and and, and to go you know and, and the other thing is i thought about like you following your authentic self and just following your inner voice and to see where it's led from you know helping in the sid's office to tickets uh and working with dr lapchick like to work in, you know, sort of side by side with Deion Sanders now, <laughs> like, man, it must be a whirlwind just to like, think about, you know, where you were and, and it just it, how time flies. And, um, you know, obviously Deion's in the news now and, and I can't even remember why, like I told you, you know, in some of our previous conversations, you know, I came across your name, but, you know, this is a space that's always been interesting to me since that story I shared with you. Yeah. And, you know, being from Detroit um, and always driving kids home and my mom always took everybody in and it's just we were integrated like in fifth grade, like I never thought anything of it. Right. And it's it's, you know, like I said, since in the intro, like since 2016, uh, you know, people have come out of their rabbit holes. But one of the things I thought about was, do you typically deal with athletics or do you educate like professor like do professors ever come to you and say, you know, I need to do a better job in my classrooms. You know, can you can you help educate me on some of the nuances because I'm really ignorant in, in this space. I actually have not had that happen. I have had professors, administrators who've asked me to do it with their classes, but not from a, pro, a professor directly to say, "Hey, I need help in in this 
uh, in this specific area. I would like for that to happen because for me, departmentally, that shows, yeah, or or individually, because uh, I think it shows a level of awareness that a lot of people yeah. don't want to acknowledge. So I would I would appreciate that happen, but it, it hasn't happened, not individually anyway, or, or from one specific department. But I have had, like I say, individual professors and, and departments say, "Hey, can you do this with our students that we serve?" Or we have this program coming in. Can you speak with them, et cetera? Um, and I tend to enjoy that too because it gives the opportunity to to kind of infuse it into. Uh, those young minds that are still impressionable and still, you know, have an opportunity to really learn and understand the world in a different way because they're still coming up in it. So when you when you deal with student athletes, what what are typically the things, the challenges that you face that you help put better tools in their toolbox with? Yeah. So de- it depends on the not the context, but it depends on on kind of what what is needed, of course. But the basic starting point, if you will, is really getting them to understand what diversity, equity, and inclusion means. Um, especially with the student athletes of today, a lot of them already have some type of idea or have already had um, instances um, where it's been apparent that it exists. And so it's easier to recall examples to, to really talk about, but um, it's really teaching the nuance and the difference of what the three are and how they kind of intersect and how they might play into somebody's experience, right? And so- Wait, so hold, hold that thought for a second. So nuance is important, right? Because as I gave you that example <laughs> earlier about this guy that- is pushing back on some of my comments with regards to a post that I made about Kyrie and how he's donated three hundred twenty thousand dollars in the last two weeks, and he's like, "Yeah, well, he wasn't. He didn't apologize for his initial situation." I'm like, "You mean the situation where he was treated like a slave? You mean yeah. that situation?" So I said, "Clearly, you don't understand nuance." Yeah. And so, um, anyways, you know, th- those types of things, I don't think people really have a, a grasp on. Yeah. Um, so, you know, give people an idea of what kind of example you're, you know, for example, talking about what, what is a nuance, you know, like one of the obvious ones is if you, you're talking to a white person and they say, wow, you're so articulate. Right. Like, right. That that's one of the ones that most white people should know at this point. You know, it's like not that you explain a point so articulately, but you're so articulate as if a person of color couldn't be articulate. Right. You know, so that's that's like one example. But what are some of the things that you typically face, you know, that you notice that you're like, hey, you know, um, you need to be a little bit more mindful of these types of things? Yeah. So when it comes to mind immediately is I'll, I, I do this activity um, with the athletes where uh, I'll have them. I'll say a, a statement and have them essentially respond to it. Right. And two statements I'll use not exclusively, but I'll use uh, consecutively, I guess, is the right term where I'll say, hey, uh, was your last school a diverse school, whether it's high school, college, wherever you came from, right? And you'll get some of them that will say like, oh, yeah, it was because, you know, I grew up um, in LA. So, you know, it's very diverse racially or um, I went to public school, you know, so it was very diverse as far as racially. You'll get others will say it wasn't because I went to um, all boys school, all girls school, a private school, et cetera, right? And so they will get the nuance of, well, not well I guess they would they would get the difference of right just what basic diversity is right and so I'll follow up and say was your last school an inclusive school and most people wouldn't be able to really understand or tell the difference and uh, some you'll get it others you won't and then we'll kind of have more of a conversation around okay what is the difference because most people tie them together and they're not the same they're they might be related but they're not the exact same right and so we'll give examples of like hey if your last school that you went to you know had all these different people that's great But if they're not integrated or they're not mixing and mingling or if they're not together or they don't do anything, it's all separate. That's not inclusive. That's not that's segmented. Right. That's segregated. That's that's a difference. Like the diversity can be present, but that doesn't mean that people are actually, you know, connecting, integrating, really being one with one another. That's not really inclusive. Right. And so uh, that's one example that we typically use just again to kind of understand what the nuance is. Um, we'll use different examples too, specifically around uh, similar to what you just mentioned, as far as just different phrases and terms that can be um, seen as uh, not inclusive or exclusive, if you will, or just have some nuance in regards to stereotypes, bias, all these things. So we use some of them too, but usually that's the baseline that we'll we'll try to start at to 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 kind of set that foundation of hey, there's an actual difference between these two phrases that everybody uses as the same. I ask you about mental health because I. You know, I think obviously um, it's been more, you know, at the forefront uh, at every level. Yeah. And 
So is do you cross over there in any way? Uh, more so in collaboration, oh, okay. not necessarily from um, collaborating out. Yeah, yeah, not necessarily from a programmer perspective, but we have uh, because somebody might be more comfortable coming and talking to you than you know somebody in the mental health space. You know, let's just be real; it could be a white person, and yeah. they they relate to you, and they're like, "Man, this guy, you know, understands me. I need to go talk to him. Like, I'm not feeling it, and you know, uh, you know, because the pressures, like, it's just a lot of pressure at a power five. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so we'll we'll um. A lot of the ways that I'll try to collaborate or just try to be mindful is I, I'll know basic things, right? So uh, if somebody's exhibiting a specific behavior, I know at least the basic things that I should do. Um, and then I collaborate with our, we have a, a, a psychological health and performance department um, that has five clinicians. And so I know all of them like the back of my hand and we actually mm -hmm. share a staff member too and so we have a nice little setup to where we're already talking in regards to what the work looks like and how to support one another and so the best way that i i usually am a part of it is just knowing what the resources are so i can immediately direct our athletes to them but i've i've, I've had instances where um not necessarily like colorado but in in some of the previous um uh, roles and, and places i've been uh, i've had instances where I've, I've been talking to athletes and they're like yeah i'm struggling or yeah, I, I tried to do this the other day. I'm like, all right, well, thanks for sharing. I'm not really equipped to talk about this, but so-and-so, you know, in this department is, is really, really good. And I trust them. You want to go over there. They're like, yep, let's go. And so we'll walk over there and go talk to the individual and make sure that the, the student athlete is getting the resources they need to, to essentially, you know, start to feel like themselves again. And so definitely have been some instances and some, some situations where uh, if I didn't have a relationship, it would have been very telling and it would have been very apparent. But I try my best to make sure that I have the relationships and, and and have the, you know, have the link necessary that if something were to pop up, that that athlete might trust me to be able to refer them to somebody. And now I have a good relationship with that athlete and I have a better relationship with that clinician too, because I was able to, you know, help provide them with someone who could use their services uh, who might have not been connected with them in the first place. Well, especially in the black and brown community, right? Because there is still that stigma and probably will be for, you know, a number of years going forward until we continue to hear the stories and the testimonials from professional athletes in particular or in Hollywood. Yep. You know, Will Smith has, you know, come out and talked about how he just broke. Yeah. Um, you know, and others are trying to find their truth like Kyrie. And, yep. you know, he made a mistake uh, on the initial part, but, you know, on the back end, he didn't. And he doesn't have anything to apologize for. And I will continue to talk about that just as much as I'll talk about in a minute with you about the uh, white influencers, especially in the NFL, who aren't doing enough. But I'm going to table that for a second. And I, I want to ask you a question. Obviously, I want to ask you about the buzz around Colorado because of Dion and yep. how things have sort of shifted and, and everyone's sort of got to elevate their game now. Yep. Um, but, you know, we, we know the obvious things that happen with with uh, Colin Kaepernick, how he's been blackballed and whiteballed by the NFL uh but there's been from my perspective and a number of people have agreed you could disagree uh more white influencers like dr labchick uh who have at least been more vocal uh whether it's popovich in the nba or steve kerr you know people that have just you know jj reddick uh not as many in the nfl which is uh one of my points of uh sources of contention um but do you think and, and i thought about this i don't know if i'm way off base but, you know, obviously George Floyd um, changed the per perspective, as Dr. Lapchick calls it, a racial reckoning, yep. uh, you know, in 2020. But do you think Dion and what he's doing in Colorado is very unique? They've hired three consecutive uh, African-American football coaches. Yep. But, do you, but do you think that Dion in a different way is getting white people – to to see black america in a way where they may either let their guard down or want to be more educated uh or am i way off base there because i think that he's you know able to cross some lines because of his entire past yeah and you know i don't know to me it's exciting i mean i'm a michigan fan but uh <laughs> i mean i'm rooting for dion i'll be honest with you because you know like I said, there's a lot of layers, right? But 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 his success matters for the next person. Your it success does. matters for the next person. And it as does. fair or unfair as that is, you know, we're we're still living in in a white world. Yeah. And so you know what what not only what is the buzz like, uh, man, I can't. You know, for all his videos. You know, the way he's approaching. You know, the videography and going to restaurants and, 
you know, just the buzz in the department and how you've elevated your game and how maybe you've got, uh, you know, this this newfound excitement uh, to be a part of, you know, the team there. But, you know, am I am I off base with that other, you know, component that I that I mentioned that, you know, he's able to not even intentionally, unintentionally uh, able to bring people together? Yeah, I so I think I have a I have a mixed answer. I think because of who he is personally, his career, his past, his persona, uh, he's going to make people interested because of who he personally is. He's creating cultural interest. That is a that's a fact. Making but white making white people more conscious and deliberate on a daily basis to be more anti racist. He's not necessarily doing that. I yeah, I don't think so. Um, okay. And I don't think it's it's a bad thing. I just think that isn't where it is yet. Yeah. I do think there have been glimpses of of things like if you open or if you watch his opening press conference, he says, "Well, you know, I'm I'm the only African American to be hired after one was fired in the entire cycle this year, right?" Or even mentioning like, hey, you know, A.D. Rick George, you know, you're you're the first to hire three consecutive. Like, I, I, I understand and I appreciate that. So there are instances where someone could lean in and say, huh, I, I didn't know that. Let me learn more about that. Right. And so I, I do think that he does a good job of inserting it in. You know, um, what, what I think went under the radar is the video at Jackson State uh, at his last game with the white player. Player, yeah. Who was crying. You know, yep. I think people have this image that every everybody that plays at an HBC is black, yep. and he's consoling this white guy. Um, and I just thought that was I don't people haven't talked enough about that to me. I think that was not only from an athletic perspective so powerful, but what yep. he what he said and the 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 black and white interaction it yep. just I just thought that was really powerful. But anyways, yep. go ahead. Sorry about that. No, you're you're good. Yeah, I I, I think uh there there are instances where he definitely adds it in and and it can. It can it can pique some interest for sure, and so that's something that I, I hope continues. And I, um, as we continue to have more conversations, I hope that he does a little bit more of. Just to to be candid, I'm hoping we'll get there one day. Uh, but again, I, I do think just based on his persona and who he is and his personal background, perspective, his influence, that he's going to invite people to be interested to have the conversations that need to be had. And I'm hoping that we can continue to leverage that just based on who he is and some of his own personal interests as well, because even in my brief conversations with them, that's something that he has an interest in doing is continue to kind of influence people to have the conversations again, that really need to be had. How many more ticket requests have you gotten from your family members? <laughs> since <Seattle was> hired? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, it definitely has, has been a lot. Even, even coming home for the holidays, people are like, what school do you work at again? I'm like, oh, I work at Colorado. They're like, oh, that's where Dion just went. Oh, you know, I gotta. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I, I, yeah, I understand, but it's Man. it's uh, well, you, you talk about buzz. We've had. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna shout out our our um, our external team too because my office is Absolutely. is next door to theirs, and so I've seen the difference over the past month. In the past month, we've had mm-hmm. six of our top ten in the past ten years merchandise sales day have been in the past month just from from, from. so it's it's been yes and uh, like talking to them and i'm like are y'all okay are y'all doing better they're like look we're we're happy we're getting this value but it's just (laughs) it's nothing like you know we've seen right it's just it's just vastly different in regards to just what it um just kind of keeping up with it and being able to kind of sustain it too so yeah the the buzz has been unbelievable and he definitely is I would say the probably the, the most popular person in the state right now, for sure. I, I would venture to say in college football, but there are a few other people who can kind of take their mental today. But definitely within the state of Colorado, within the university, he's definitely the most popular man, e- easily, easily. And he's uh he's he's definitely doing everything he can to kind of sustain it and make sure that he's uh trying to get the roster to, to what what he deems to be you know acceptable. Oh, he will. You know, and and you mentioned that he's the most popular person in the state. And, you know, there's not many people nationwide, you know, at any level, whether you're talking about Nick Saban, you know, uh, you know, and and, and everywhere he goes. Right. Like even if he attends a basketball game, like the cameras are going to be on him as much as the game. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, that's that's incredible. That's exciting, man. It's it's, and I'm sure it spills over to the other sports, too. Like, you know, the visibility and the NIL deals and holy moly. Man, Absolutely. what a what a place to be a part of. 
Oh man. All right. Let's get to the rapid fire. I know you got to get going. Um, fascinating conversation, man. We'll, you know, definitely stay in touch and, and uh, maybe have you back. And when you guys win a national championship there and you get your, yeah, ring, I hope so. come I like, hope so. come like this, like on the <laughs> show, so. be like, yeah, buddy. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Wait, so have you been to an Avalanche game or Rockies game, Nuggets or Broncos? Like, have you been to all of them? Or I have, I haven't been to any yet. Wow. Yeah, part, but part of that too is uh, I, so my daughter came here a few minutes ago. I have a one year old, yeah. so uh, right. me and my wife moved to Colorado in May of 2021. Um, at the time, she was pregnant, and we had our baby in October of 2021. So the past, yeah. really, the whole time I've been here has been you know, helping take care of my wife and make sure that she's good, but also helping baby get situated, get in the daycare, uh, you know, trying to trying to split between home and office, all those things. So we haven't had a lot of time to really venture out. But now that uh, she's in the daycare and now that uh, my wife is back in, in kind of in the, in the work swing and things like that, we'll, we'll take some more time to really try to explore a little bit more and hopefully get to a few of those games and, and see those things. Man, shout out to the wife. Yes, absolutely. That's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, my my saving grace. What a whirlwind of a of a year, year and a half. Holy moly! Yeah. <laughs> wow, yeah, man. man. It's, God, yeah. that's yeah, like I a that's like a continuous high. Like yes, you must wake up every day like bouncing out of bed. Recharging your batteries is tough. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So are you a St. Louis Cardinals fan? Absolutely. Who is your favorite Cardinal of all time? Oh, Ozzy Smith. Yeah, Ozzy Smith. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Most people would say pool hose. You might get a few David Freeze, but no, it's, it's still the wizard. Wow. That's interesting because, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of in between it, but you're more of a younger, you know, like you're a cusper. So that's interesting. Yep. And for yep. the record, you know, I'm a Tigers fan, right? I'm from Detroit, as I mentioned okay. earlier. But uh, St. Louis baseball fans might be the most intelligent of all sport fans of any sport in the United States. I mean, they, I, they, are, they understand nuance. Like, they I, do. Man, they they're do. so they smart. Do. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's real. Do you have a favorite Absolutely. athlete? Actually, Go ahead. I, I might. No, it's still. He signs I, the Colorado uh, college football fans, of course, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I think, actually, no, I'm going to stay with Ozzy. I would say a, a close second probably would be Kurt Flood, too, though. Yeah. Mainly from a, a free agency standpoint. But. but but do you have a favorite athlete of all time of any sport? I do. <laughs> actually, I'll give you three. And it's 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 kind of funny because Dion is is was one of them. Wow. Uh, yeah. Do you know what he uh, do you know what he said when the draft was going on? What did he say? He said, I hope the Detroit Lions don't draft me. And this hurt really bad because I'm a Lions fan. <laughs> I hope the Lions don't draft me because I'm gonna ask for so much money, they're gonna have to put me in layaway. I, I I do know that <laughs> when he was getting ready to get drafted, he he was intentionally telling teams he wasn't going to play, he was gonna play baseball because he wanted to go to Atlanta. At the fifth, I do know that. I know that full story. But now I, yeah, and I saw that video about how he saw black nurses and doctors during his trip there. Yeah, and, and that he was like, that. "I got to be in Atlanta, man. I'm not going yeah. somewhere else." So representation yeah. does matter, and I talked about it. That does it, it? Absolutely. Does. So, so Dion's uh, in your top three. Who are the other two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I played cornerback in high school, and I what I wore twelve because my high school didn't have number twenty one. So wow. that was part of. But anyway, Flipped Brian. It, yeah. Yes, I flipped. Brian is one for sure. Um, and I would also say, historically, I'm going to go with Serena. Wow. I thought you were going to say Muhammad Ali. Interesting. I, Ali actually, it's, it's hard to, to boil the three. Um, and I, I, I enjoy Ali for everything he's done historically. Brian is my modern day Ali, but that's yeah that's a different conversation so I'm sure if it was uh, four and four and five might be uh it, you know, yeah the late, the late bill russell and kareem maybe yeah and and i can I, I can build out more and more right like i could throw tommy smith and john carlos in there if, if i wanted to right um uh but it's it's hard to boil the three those are the three i'm gonna say specifically from what they've done in their sport but also outside of it too Dion was my number one specific like football is my favorite sport and i play corner so it's kind of hard not to <laughs> Not to for real you know, try, try to emulate them. So man, fascinating stuff, man. So two famous people went to Missouri, Max Scherzer yep. and John Anderson. There's others. Have you ever met either one? Neither one. I've never met. Oh, either. wow. Interesting. Favorite food at a family barbecue. You're, well, you're with your family now. Is there a family fa favorite food that you have there during the holidays? Yeah, absolutely. I'm probably going for ribs or rib tips. Ooh, 
it's, they, they gotta fall off like it's like yeah. it's like it like melts and then you gotta yep, lick. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and it, it's, it's it's also uh i mean part of it is st louis thing too with the barbecue mm. but yeah that's oh, that's what i'm going for most times nice do you have a favorite tv show of all time that you grew up with probably fresh prince either that or hey arnold oh there you go yeah I love those, that. Are probably, those are probably the two. uh popcorn or candy at the movies candy oh wait what kind i am an m M&M fan wow peanut or yeah Either or. I, I like peanut <laughs> or, but I'll take either or. To the point to where if I go to the store, I'm by 80% of the time, I'm buying a bag of M&M's like, to just like chew, like munch on on the way home or whatever. Pancakes, waffles, or French toast? French toast. Oh, wow. Have you ever had uh, French toast with challah bread? Not with challah bread, no. Wow. But you know what challah bread is. You said it like you're like versed on it. That's interesting. I haven't tried it, but I'll, I'll yeah, yeah. add that to my list. Yeah, you got to add to your list because of the thickness of that Jewish bread, man. It, it's a whole different experience. I'm going to add that to my list. <laughs> uh, okay, a couple more. Best mama joke. Your mom is so dumb that she put a bag over her computer in case it crashed. <laughs> or your mom is so fat she had to iron her pants in the driveway. I'm probably going to go with the bag one. <laughs> with the bag one. All right. Where do you see yourself in five years? In the same space, or would you ever consider coaching? Uh, not coaching. Um, no. I coached for like a hot second in undergrad. Mm-hmm. Um, I was I was coaching the jumps for a um, a club track team when I was finishing up, and that was actually that was really fun, but not something I would do full time. But definitely same space. Uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, kind of like the the adjunct and, and the teaching piece. I've always right. wanted to teach, not necessarily. Uh, tenure i, I don't kind of mm-hmm. want to just teach but would love to kind of teach something on the side or teach one or two classes i would say doing a little bit more speaking too yeah that would be amazing if steph curry wins another uh ring with the roster that he has mm-hmm. uh would you put him ahead of kobe or lebron i will put him in front of kobe but not lebron you don't have a lebron ahead of mj do you i do but i wouldn't argue wow. somebody wouldn't wow interesting yeah. i was gonna say i i think it's Big picture. I, I think if he wins one more, it's is undisputed. But right now, it's it, to me, it's big picture, right? It's it's hard to argue the stats. It's hard to argue the longevity. Mm-hmm. Um, he's gonna finish unless he gets hurt. He's gonna finish with the most points all time and top ten and rebounds and assists. Yeah. It's it it to me, it's just hard. I, I get the whole he hasn't won every finals yeah. trip, but it's uh, nine straight finals. It's it's hard, man. It's it's hard, and it's it it's also hard because. The the MJ I remember is the Wizards MJ. Okay, so, well, so that's different, yeah, for yeah, sure. Right. right. Yeah, I saw glimpses of – I was born in 93, so I saw glimpses yeah. of peak MJ, but not yeah. – yeah. Yeah, he evolved, so I appreciated how he evolved. Uh, okay, so last question. So if you could have any five people at your dinner table, past or present, dead or alive, but you've never met them before, who would be at your dinner table? I'm going Jesus of Nazareth. I'm going Ali. Yeah. Would you like to have like a an Elon Musk at the table, or is that no, not, not no. at all? No, I'm, 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 I, I, I can everything I would need to want to know about Elon, I can find via Twitter. Okay. So while you're thinking about that, let me let me pose this this uh, part because it's it's important to me because uh, you're a football guy, you understand nuance, you're in this space. I do. And, I, and I've been hypercritical of the Tom Brady's, the Aaron Rodgers, the Eli Mannings, the Peyton Mannings, the Troy Aikmans, the Tony Romos, uh, and there are others, uh, basically the white influencers in the most popular sport. Yep. And I can't for the life of me, uh, besides the fact that you had a MAGA hat in your locker uh, a few years ago, understand why, forget the NFL um, and the commissioner because he answers to the owners. But are the... Do the white influencers that I just mentioned have a, a greater responsibility to speak out more about the Colin Kaepernick's and uh, the the murders that continue to happen in society uh, that are disproportionate to the black and brown community, or you know they don't have to do anything and you don't care because it drives me up the fucking wall that that they don't say more. My answer is do do they have that responsibility? No, they should but they don't. 
that's that's my my short answer. I also operate the thought process of we're all interconnected in some way. And so it would be nice for them to kind of take that onus. But until you make it apparent to people or until you acknowledge that link, they're not going to think as such that we're connected. Right. And so I would love if if they did take that onus and, and have more of those conversations. But the reality is they don't have to because people aren't the masses, not people, the masses aren't asking them to. Yeah, that's true. Well, shout out to, like I said, Steve Kerr, Popovich, uh, JJ Reddick, and Rex Chapman in particular. Yep. Uh, all right, who else at the dinner table? Harriet Tubman, Michael Jackson. Wow, that's interesting. And, yeah, and I'm probably going... Not Malcolm or MLK, huh? I thought about MLK. How about I'm Joe trying Rogan? To find... No, not Joe Rogan either. Everything I, I would want to know, I can find on the internet. I'm going to do a wild card here. Um, I'm probably going to add Maverick Carter. I don't know who that is. Maverick Carter is um, LeBron's right hand man. Wow. Um, his story, he played high school basketball with LeBron. He's the one that runs what's LeBron's studio name? Oh, yeah. I can't remember his name right now, but he's the one that is typically on camera doing the interviews. He's usually at the shop uh, in the chair. Interesting. Wow. But he, he's, he's, uh, he's not as, agent because that's rich paul but he's more of a i guess more of a business manager if you will wow but he's he's the one that you've seen dozens of athletes put their friends in charge of their business ventures and it hasn't worked facts that part maverick carter has worked and i am fascinated to understand why he worked and why that worked mm-hmm. when for hundreds of others it has not wow that's fascinating what a great answer uh, yeah, and th- these are the spaces, those are the kinds of stories that, you know, I'm fascinated by also, uh, you know, we plan on having Mahmoud abdul Rauf on the show, you okay. know, jo- Jocelyn Rose Lyons, who's directing Stand, which will come out in 2023, that talks about Mahmoud's whiteballing by the NBA and David Stern. Yep. Uh, so, you know, we need to have these conversations continue. Uh, man, what a fascinating conversation with, with the kiddo and, and the family there with you um, and you finding the time to, to spend time with us. Shout out to Dr. Labchick. Uh, shout out to to Dion and all the Buffalo fans. Um, you know, go Colorado as long as you're not playing Michigan in the national championship <laughs> game, man. <laughs> like for real. I mean, it, it would be good for so many reasons. Good for football. Um, I'm tired of hearing about the uh, you know the talk about Dion. You know, leaving HBCs. It's it's an asinine, you know, just whole premise in my mind. Uh, what he did to bring exposure there and what he's doing to bring exposure to college football. And to Colorado, he could have waited. You know, he didn't get the job at Florida State. He should have uh, because of, you know, some false narrative. And so it, in my eyes, it's it's all freaking good, man. And for you to be a part of that, uh, props to you. And uh, fascinating stuff, man, from ticket taker to the SID's office to what you're doing now. And, you know, you'll continue to leverage that as you should um, to, you know, be a part of something bigger than yourself. Uh, and to educate people in a way that, um, you know, especially white people need to be educated. So flowers to you, man. Shout out. Happy New Year to you and the missus and and the kiddo and the family. And uh, let's stay in touch. Much love to you. And uh, appreciate you so much uh, coming into the Sports Daily Podcast as our last guest of season three. And the the, the floor is yours. Anything else that you want to share with people about, you know, how to find out more about Colorado, you know, athletics or just any message that you want to get out there to the masses? We've been in almost 40 countries uh, you know, we've we've uh, you know shared a lot of information with people. And we're we're humbled by it all, but it's again, it's just about being a bridge and being an ally and and uh, you know mobilizing to make this place a better place and putting better tools in people's toolboxes. Yeah, I, I, uh, first of all, I appreciate uh, you uh, reaching out and, and wanting to to connect, and uh, definitely appreciate you having me on on the Sports Daily podcast. Uh, I'm going to leave three things. They're all going to be advertising, so I apologize, but no, I'm- it's all good, man. If you want to learn more about me, um, you can follow me at Dewan B. Baker on Twitter. Um, you'll get a lot of takes about just my work, but you'll also get some takes about sports. You might get some sneaker takes in there, too. Hello. Secondly, <laughs> if you want to know about uh, what we're doing you know, with, with Colorado, um, you can follow the main page, which is the SCU Buffs. If you want to know more about the DEI piece, um, our tag on Twitter is at Inclusive Buffs, a uh, brand new page that was launched last week. And so... Uh, we'll we'll add some more content there to to make sure that people can kind of see some of the things that we're doing both you know both publicly and kind of behind the scenes too. Um, and then lastly, one of the things you also mentioned 
DICE organization that, that, that me and a handful of others uh, helped co-founded a few years ago. We really founded it on this premise of we knew after this racial reckoning of 2020, there were going to be a lot of people kind of tasked with doing this role. And at the time, the community was very small. And we wanted to build an opportunity for people to really have community to understand how this work operates and how to best serve one another. And so uh, we build dice really in this mindset of, hey, if you're stepping into this job, you now have access to right now we have 370 ish people who are kind of signed up as members, if you will, wow. um, you get media access to all of them you can talk to them about the role talk to them about resources really understand you know some of the the, the things that are necessary to kind of do the job at a high level uh, so we created dice to really be a, a member serving community and so if you want to learn more about dice you can also follow it at dice athletics on twitter and so twitter is our preferred choice of of a uh, of a uh, social media so you can follow all three at those places and um you know, appreciate everybody listening and hopefully I was able to kind of provide some insight perspective to uh, hopefully spark a thought or two. Absolutely. And, you know, the more that multiple layers are involved in this uh, diversity, equity and inclusion and the extrapolated pieces, you know, that's going to help people have a greater understanding of it and slowly will chip away and uh, see the narrative uh, bridge that gap, um, you know, in every aspect, right? Athletics, uh, hiring practices, healthcare, yep. you know, and, and the list goes on and on. All right. Absolutely. Happy new year, everybody. Much love Dewan, to you and the wife and the kiddo again, and uh, we'll stay in touch and good luck. Go buffs. Go buffs. I appreciate it. Thanks. Mike. All right, man. Talk to you soon, man. All right. Have appreciate it. Thank you. Hey everyone. If you're looking for today's outtakes, you've come to the right place. Enjoy. All right. Time to rock and roll. Ladies and gentlemen. D money. Hi, how you doing? All right, man. What's happening? Doing well. Good to see you. Doing well. uh, if you hear some stuff behind me, I'm in the house full of kids, so I apologize. Oh, it's all good, man. We we've we've seen it all in the sports deli, man. <laughs> Believe that. How's the family? Holiday good? Yeah, it's uh holidays are going well. Uh we're at my in-laws' house. My uh, my wife's sister has two toddlers, so oh my God. for them all to be around at the same time is pretty rare. So, Granny has uh has appreciated it for sure. Oh yeah, I got a break. That's awesome. Uh, so I'm gonna do a formal intro and then we'll we'll chop it up, man. I got some good stuff to talk to you about. Um, and okay. uh, haven't haven't seen you on many podcasts, so I'm I'm truly humbled and honored, especially uh, anyone associated with Dr. Lapchick is, uh, you know, truly humbling to have you in this space. Appreciate it, Mike. You're a you're a little scrambled on my end. You I can hear everything you're saying, but it comes across really statically. If that makes sense, sounds perfectly clear here. So okay. as long as it's it, uh, and unless you want to try and restart it, or are you on a computer or a phone? I'm on a computer. And like I said, I can hear you just sounds really scrambled. I would I would hate to get all the way through and you're like, yeah, my sound is crap. But if it sounds good on your end and you're recording, then I don't. No, it's it's, 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 it's solid as a rock. Well, it's, it's a little echoey. You want to try and do a, your phone to see if it's better? Because it doesn't matter to me. Or you want to restart it and try again? It's your call. Because uh, the video on the camera is is... And I, I care more about audio than I do video. So the video quality, uh, if I had to choose which one was better, the audio is way better than the video. But, I mean, the video is sort of uh, pix pixelish. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. And, I, and I edit, so it's all good. Um, although I do do some outtakes <laughs> at the oh. end. <laughs> yeah, let me, uh, let me try my phone. And I'll... Oh. All right, bet. You'll uh, you I'll might actually see me jumping on now. Yeah, twice. His twin brothers jumping on, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Do you have a twin? I don't think you have a twin. I don't. I don't have a twin. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna jump off of the laptop. All right, bet. We hope you enjoyed the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that was Dewan B. Baker from the University of Colorado. And until next time. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> Good morning, Scotty. Uh, we're starting the podcast right now with Dewan 
B. Baker. My dentist told me that I could start coloring my teeth, but I feel like you'd have to maintain that for like the rest of your life. So am I going to do that for like 40, the next 40 years? Are my teeth yellow? I appreciate it. I mean, like if I had really white teeth, wouldn't that be weird? I feel like this is just natural. You know what I'm saying? We're waiting for Dewan B. Baker. Dewan earned his bachelor's, his bachelor's degree or bachelor's. His bachelor's from the University of Missouri, where he also participated in track and field in the long jump. And we've had a number of Olympic track and field personalities. It is the lights. Man, I forgot what the hell we were talking about. Can you <laughs> and refresh my memory? Boom. Look at that. All oh, right. Oh, that's yeah, solid. better, better yeah. on my end. Uh, the tie that's uh, in your profile picture, that is not a Colorado tie. It's, it's like, not. yeah, I'm try I was trying to figure out, and it, it didn't look like a Nebraska tie either because there was some blue in there. So no, it it's – Like a wedding? Just, no, actually, it was uh, – I was doing a headshot for – this thing called Leadership Lincoln. So it was essentially oh. kind of a community leadership program. And it was oh. just a regular blue and orange tie. Uh, oh, solid. And I just, I liked it. And that was the headshot. That's the headshot I like. And when Colorado got it, they were like, oh, huh, let's, let's change this color a little bit. Because it looks like <laughs> real, real Broncos. Yeah. And I was right. Like, I was going to say Broncos or uh, yeah. even Syracuse, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. So. Yeah. So they, they just, they blended the colors, which is fine with me. Yeah, that's not all right. Let's 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 get ready, to rock and roll, so you can get back to the family. Um, and uh, definitely excited, man. Really excited. All right. Talk soon, man. I'll let you know when all the stuff comes out, the teasers and uh, the links, and I'll send them to you. You do whatever you want with it. And uh, anything I can do to help, man, let me know. I appreciate it. We'll be in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm glad I came across, uh, you know, your space and. Uh, uh, Man, I told Dr. Lapchick about you coming on. He's like, man, can't say enough about him. So, uh, <laughs> I got to reach out to, to Dr. Lapchick, man. It's been a while since we last talked. Yeah, he's amazing, man. He he came on early on in this reckoning. Uh, and then, you know, he, he responds to every email. Anytime I ever send him something or have a question about anything in this space, I just refer to the expert. Yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, for those of you who don't know, man, uh, listen to the podcast with Dr. Lapchick. His story is incredible, um, and his dad was incredible. He's amazing, and uh, anything he touches uh, you know, is better for it. And the Tides report that you guys all know about, uh, you know, even if you didn't realize it was you know, directly related to him, he's the one that puts out the report cards you know, about um, you know, where we're going with all the sports and you know, grading them. And uh, the grades have been pretty good lately. Yeah, they have. Yeah, let's uh let's keep improving them. Let's keep improving them, especially at the collegiate level. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, Literally yeah so ridiculous. Got work to do. Yeah. All right, got to go to my game. Got to get make sure my daughter doesn't have COVID. Uh, she just took a test. She's had a sore throat for a couple of days. So you know, kids. All right, I understand. I'm hoping you uh, or hoping she gets a negative test. Yeah, appreciate it. All right, we'll talk soon, man. Appreciate Thank you, brother. You. Yeah. All right, man. Late. Sorry. Boy, that was phenomenal. Great job and much love to everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us. Remember, Black Lives Matter. Stop the bullying. Stop the Asian hate. Contact your local and state politicians for any inequalities for any individual or any group that's being marginalized. Also, everyone, we want to raise awareness for those individuals that are currently imprisoned for nonviolent offenses in particular those with long-term sentences that are disproportionate in particular to those people in the black and brown community. And I want to send a shout out to 40tons.co. 40 Tons is a socially conscious cannabis brand and they're a social enterprise using the regulated cannabis industry to fight injustice in particular for cannabis prisoners. So check them out again at 40, the number four, the number zero, tons, plural, 40tons.co, because what they're doing in the cannabis space and being a socially conscious company is truly incredible, and uh, they have my full support. And also wanted to remind all of you, if you're having a tough time, 
you can always call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and that number is 800-273-8255. That's 800-273-8255. And now you can call 988. That's it. All you got to do is dial 988 from any phone. And they are available 24-7, 365 days a year. And if you want to follow me on social media or check out other episodes of this amazing Sports Deli podcast or any of my other podcasts, go to my link tree at linktree backslash Mike Hootner. And if you'd like to support us at the Sports Deli, we'd love to have you either make a one-time donation or feel free to make a donation monthly, either 99 cents a month, $4.99 a month, or $9.99 a month. If you have uh, questions about that, Send me an email again to thesportsdeli at gmail.com and I will send you the link on how you can do that. Uh, you can also find it at the bottom of every podcast on Spotify or uh, Apple Podcasts. There's a link at the bottom to support the show. Please check, check out our website at thesportsdelipodcast.com. Make sure that we continue the conversations with regards to three strikes and you're out and mandatory minimums, especially people that are in jail for nonviolent offenses. So those things need to change. And remember, gents and ladies, please remember to do your monthly self-breast examinations. And remember, guys, this afflicts about 1,500 men annually with about a third of those resulting in death. So we want to make sure that we do our monthly self-breast examinations, both men and women. And guys, remember to do your self-testicular examinations every month as well. Until next time, remember it takes a village. I'm Hootie Hoot. This has been a production of Hootie Hoot Productions. Thank you for joining us in the Sports Deli, where everyone deserves a seat at the table. Remember it takes a village. Much love, everybody.